Imagine you're a physics-inspired data scientist who just returned from an amazing vacation in Miami Beach with your friends and their dogs. You spent the entire trip capturing beautiful moments with your iPhone. Friends laughing on the beach, dogs playing in the sand, shopping adventures at local malls, and those perfect sunset shots that make you feel alive. It was one of those trips where you couldn't stop taking photos. The day after you return, you wake up with a smile on your face, eager to relive those memories. You grab your phone, open the Photos app, and prepare to scroll through hundreds of images. But then, you freeze. You're staring at your phone, completely shocked by what you see. Something magical has happened while you were sleeping. Your iPhone has already created a memory called Miami Beach with Friends, complete with music and automatic transitions that perfectly capture the vibe of your trip. You didn't create this. The phone did it by itself. You tap around and discover more surprises. All your friends' faces are neatly grouped under people. Each friend has their own album with every photo they appear in. Under pets, your friends' dogs are recognized as separate identities. Your iPhone somehow knows that this furry golden retriever is one dog and that fluffy poodle is another, completely different dog. It even highlights featured photos, those perfect shots of you laughing with friends at sunset, the ones you'd want to share first. You know you didn't organize anything manually, didn't tag anyone or create albums. Everything seems effortless, almost like the app reads your mind. This makes you wonder, how does it actually work? Does the iPhone guess based on file names or use simple face-matching methods? If you're interested to know how your phone's photo gallery recognizes images of the same person, stay tuned. By the way, this video comes with Python code that you can use to reproduce the images we show in this video. The link to the code is in the description below. Did you know that every machine learning model, from simple regression to image generating models like DAL-E, can be explained by a single elegant equation? If you're interested in learning machine learning in a unified way, visit our webpage at compuflare.com. This is a unique place to understand every machine learning model through one elegant equation from a physics-inspired perspective. In addition to the courses, we offer end-to-end -end intermediate and advanced projects that develop your skills, experience, and online presence, helping you land top industry roles. Visit compuflare.com and start building your data science career. But how exactly did the iPhone recognize your friend's dog from a blurry background where the dog is barely visible? How did it know that a photo taken at the beach and another taken at the mall show the same person, even though the lighting, angle, and context are completely different? Now the scientist in you wakes up. How on earth did the phone learn to understand faces, dogs, beaches, malls, and moments without you ever labeling a single image? This isn't magic, it's technology, and you want to understand it. So, you decide to find out by doing. You want to build a mini AI model that does exactly what you observed on your iPhone. Not a full production system, but something that captures the core concepts and demonstrates the fundamental principles at work. You already know from your background in data science that the iPhone doesn't look at pixels directly. That would be too crude. Instead, it converts images into vectors. Numerical fingerprints that capture the essence of what's in the image. In modern AI, this process is called embedding. Usually, a very complex architecture of deep neural networks trained on superclusters of GPUs does exactly this job of converting images to meaningful numerical vectors. These aren't just random numbers. The embedding process captures the meaning and context of the images. For example, images of dogs become vectors that are close together in this mathematical space. An image of a person is a vector that's far from the vectors representing dogs. Distances in this space reveal similarity. If two image vectors are close to each other, the images are similar. If they're far apart, the images are different. It's the first layer of tagging images in modern AI models, the foundation everything else builds upon. But wait a minute. Embedding takes extensive GPU clusters and months of training neural networks on millions of images. You want to build something simple just to grasp the idea. You need to find something simpler that you can implement without massive computational resources. You know that images are made of pixels, and each pixel is actually a number representing how bright that pixel is. 
So, you decide to stick to pixel values and use them as a numerical vector representing the images. This is much simpler than training a neural network. Of course, dropping the embedding layer will significantly reduce the ability to tag complex images. You're aware of this trade-off. To compensate, you decide to work with a simpler type of image. So you choose to work with the MNIST dataset. MNIST is a large benchmark dataset of handwritten digits ranging from 0 to 9. It contains 70,000 grayscale images, each representing a single handwritten digit. Each image is 28 by 28 pixels, which means each image can be represented as a 784-dimensional vector. Just flatten all those pixels into a single long list of numbers. The digits are written by thousands of individuals, capturing different writing styles, curves, and thicknesses. The numbers of the pixels are intensities that range from 0, which is black, to 255, which is white, allowing computers to capture subtle variations in handwriting. MNIST has become the Hello World dataset of computer vision. Simple enough to understand, yet rich enough to test real machine learning ideas. It's perfect for your experiment. Having solved the issue of converting images to numeric vectors, you now face another problem. The numeric vectors that represent images are very large. In production systems, embedding spaces usually have thousands of components. Your choice of representing images directly with their pixel values doesn't help either. Even very simple images like those in the MNIST dataset have 784 total pixels. That means the numeric vector representing your images is 784 dimensional. That's a lot of dimensions to work with. It would be computationally expensive and very slow. So you have no choice but to replace the large vectors with smaller ones. And that's actually what your iPhone does as well. It reduces the dimensionality of the data to make everything faster and more efficient. But how exactly are you going to reduce the dimension of your vectors from 784 to something like 50? You can't just randomly pick 50 pixels and throw away the rest. You'd lose critical information. You notice that not all the pixels of handwritten images are useful. The actual digits are somewhere in the middle of the picture. The pixels at the center have much more information than those dark pixels at the edges, which are almost always black and don't tell you anything about what digit is being written. So you need to find a systematic way of selecting the important pixels and dropping the pixels with little information. But how exactly are you going to tell your computer to do so? You need a mathematical procedure. So you turn to a very interesting method called Principal Component Analysis, or PCA for short. But how exactly will PCA solve the issue of taking the important pixels and dropping the unimportant ones? To grasp the concept, Let's do a bit of visualization. Since we can only visualize up to three dimensions, let's for a moment assume that our images have only three pixels. You make a plot whose X, Y, and Z axes represent the three pixel values of images. Then, you add your images to the plot one at a time. Each image is now a single point at X, Y, Z coordinates, which are simply the three pixel values of that image. But you see something interesting. All the points are lying along a line, not scattered throughout the entire three-dimensional space. So if you rotate your coordinate system so that one of the axes is along that line, then you can express the position of each point by just one number, the position of the point on this axis. You might ask, then what about the other two coordinates? Well, as you can see in the scatter plot, they seem to be always zero for all the images, so they don't add any information. We can just stick to this single axis. This means we've reduced our dimensions from 3 to 1. This is PCA in action. The new axes are simply called principal components. They're the directions in which your data varies the most. But here's the problem. Your handwritten images have more than 3 pixels. They have 784 pixels, and you cannot visualize 784 axes. So how exactly should you find the principal components? You need to rely on math rather than visualization. To understand the math, let's get back to our 3-pixel visualization. In what we see, two of the pixels, let's call them axis 1 and axis 2, are actually highly correlated. When one has a high value, the other tends to have a high value too. And what you want is to rotate your coordinates along directions where pixels are correlated. Mathematically speaking, this means you're after eigenvectors of the correlation matrix of your dataset. 
Let me explain what these all mean, step by step. First, you prepare a spreadsheet in which each row contains the pixels of one image and the next row represents the next image. This is called a matrix dataset. It's just an organized way of storing all your data. Next, you want to find the correlation matrix. This is a matrix where the rows and columns are the images themselves. For example, row number one and column number two represent the first and second images in the dataset, and the value at that position indicates how much the two images are correlated. The higher the value, the more the correlation. To construct this correlation matrix, we just transpose the original dataset and multiply it by the dataset itself. This means row number one and column number two of the correlation matrix, which represents how much image number one is correlated with image number two, is the dot product of the vectors representing image number one and image number two. But why does this dot product represent that correlation? Well, the dot product of two vectors is proportional to the cosine of the angle between them. In other words, if two vectors are highly correlated, the angle between them is close to zero, and the cosine of zero has its highest value, which is one. To better understand the relation between correlation and vector angles, note that the most correlated vector to a vector is itself. And the angle it makes with itself is zero. Perfect correlation. Okay, now that we've constructed the correlation matrix, we need to rotate our coordinates such that the correlation matrix becomes diagonal. That means in this new coordinate system, the off-diagonal components of the correlation matrix are all zero. Only the diagonal has non-zero values. And the new axes in which the correlation matrix is diagonal are just those along which the data points lie. In other words, these are the principal components, the directions that matter most. The diagonal values indicate how spread out data points are along the corresponding axes. The most important direction, the one we want to keep, is the one whose diagonal value is the largest. It captures the most variance in your data. And the diagonal values of the axes along which data points are not spread out much, the ones we want to throw out, are nearly zero. They don't contribute much information. So the problem is now reduced to solving an eigenvalue problem. In this video, I won't get into the details of how this is solved mathematically. But many computational software packages can take your correlation matrix and return the axes of interest and their corresponding diagonal components, which we call eigenvalues. Okay, you just solved another hurdle and have a systematic method to reduce the dimensions of images from 784 to, for example, 50. You've kept the 50 most important directions and thrown away the rest. It's now time to cluster the images. In the iPhone, this clustering is done by training complex neural networks. It requires GPU clusters and extensive training time. But you don't have access to them right now, and you still want to build a mini-tagging system that works like the iPhones. However, since you're dealing with easy-to-tag images, just handwritten digits, you can avoid that route. So you switch to classical machine learning models. They're simpler, faster, and perfect for your purposes. In this video series, we've already explored Gaussian mixture models and k-means as two common clustering methods in machine learning. So I refer you to watch those videos for the details. Here, I'll just summarize k-means for this specific application. k-means is a clustering method that assumes your data belongs to k unknown groups. Since the handwritten images are integers from 0 to 9, you set the number of groups to 10. You're telling the algorithm, hey, there are 10 different digits here, find them. The goal is to discover those groups purely based on similarity between the images. This is crucial. Because in the Apple iPhone, we never tell the phone which picture is a dog and which one is a human. The iPhone even knows which images belong to a single person, and it uses similarities between images to figure this out automatically. The way k-means measures similarity is through the distance between the data points of images. Remember, each image is now a point in a 50-dimensional space after we applied PCA. Technically, these 50 numbers are called the features of the model, and the coordinate system is called the feature space. Here's how the algorithm works. The algorithm begins by randomly placing 10 points in the space, one per class of images. These are called cluster centers or centroids. 
Think of them as initial guesses for where the centers of your 10-digit groups might be. Each data point is assigned to the closest centroid. This forms K clusters. You're essentially saying, this image of a digit is closest to centroid number 3, so it belongs to cluster 3. Then, the algorithm recomputes each centroid as the average, or mean, of all points in that cluster. This is where the name k-means comes from. You're taking the mean position of all the images assigned to a cluster. After updating the centroids, points are reassigned to whichever center is now closest. Maybe an image that was in cluster 3 is now closer to cluster 5 after the centroids moved. This assignment, averaging, reassignment loop continues until the centroids stop moving significantly. Eventually, things stabilize and the algorithm converges. At convergence, the algorithm has found a stable arrangement of clusters where points that represent images are grouped around tight centers. Points in the same cluster are similar to each other and different from points in other clusters. At this time, your machine learning model has grouped the images into clusters. You have 10 clusters, and if your strategy has gone well, each cluster only contains images of a single digit. For example, one cluster contains only images that show the digit 0, and another cluster contains images that show digit 1. So now you've developed a strategy to cluster images of handwritten digits. You have a clear plan. Load the data, reduce dimensions with PCA, cluster with k-means, and visualize the results. You write a Python code and implement all these steps. The interesting part is that almost all the steps can be done effortlessly by calling appropriate functions from common machine learning libraries. Loading MNIST? There's a function for that. Applying PCA? One line of code. Running k-means? Another simple function call. After all, that's why Python is the number one language for data science. The heavy lifting is done by well-tested libraries like Scikit-Learn and NumPy. You just need to know which tools to use and how to connect them. You run the code, and moments later, you have the results. The algorithm has processed all 70,000 images and assigned each one to a cluster. You make a gallery plot as a replacement for the iPhone's galleries. Your gallery is simple. You just show the images that belong to cluster 0 in the first row images that belong to cluster 1 in the next row, and move down the rows until showing the images that belong to cluster 9 at the bottom. Each row represents one discovered group. The result is shockingly good, although not as perfect as the iPhone's. That was kind of expected. The iPhone uses embedding and complex neural networks, both of which you've replaced with simpler versions. However, conceptually, your model works similarly. The same principles are at play. Looking at the results, you see cluster 0 is a perfectly pure collection of the digit 6. Every single image in that cluster is a 6. The algorithm nailed it. Cluster 1 mostly contains the number 8, although a few impurities exist. These are called mislabeling errors. Looking closely, two of the numbers are the digit 3, which makes sense because 3 and 8 can look similar when handwritten, especially if the 3 has rounded loops. Another perfect cluster is cluster 7, where all the images belong to the digit 0. Nice clean circles, all grouped together. Although your model is not working as perfectly as the iPhone's model, you now have a clear working idea of how the iPhone groups the same person's images under the same category in its photo galleries. You've built a simplified version that demonstrates the core concepts, convert images to numbers, reduce dimensions, cluster by similarity. That's the recipe.